All right, so what we got here, this is the mango beer, San Diego Cali. I read some reviews before I bought this. I always read reviews before I buy beer. It said it was too much mango, which made me think it would be just the right amount of mango for you. This is a pretty expensive beer for a socialist like yourself. Us, I, us common men just drink Bud Light and Coors Light, <laughs> and now this beer has mango in it. You common men. Yeah. I have expensive tastes. I know how to. I know how to how to live, how to relax. You okay. know. What, all right. So you're trying to. How, how, would you consider yourself like a relaxation novice, or would you consider yourself someone who can who can really turn off your brain when you want to? So I wouldn't say I'm a relaxation novice, but I am someone who fortunately doesn't suffer from anxiety. Okay. So I don't get worked up about things. Um, I'm able to keep a level ahead for the most part. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm the beneficiary of that. So I don't think I seek relaxation, but I will tell you when I was in Mexico, I was very relaxed. Yeah. It's very different <laughs> than being in LA and grinding. So maybe, maybe I need to that start seeking out some relaxation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, that's what I'm here for. Yeah. Right. We're going to try a new beer every, every time we do this. And Perfect. I've never had this beer before. It's nice. But I'm thinking this it's drinkable. is drinkable. Like, For someone yeah. who doesn't really drink beer, I mean, this is totally fine. I would put this at like a 2.75 out of 5. Okay. That's what I would rate that beer. I feel like it's it's just, it's not quite cutting it for me in terms of like the malt and the, it's not hazy. It's a lot more of like the West Coast style, which is like bitter and very fruity, very juicy. Not bad. Might be more your Yeah, it's your better style. than the typical IPA you find at a bar. Yes. Yeah. That I think I that's say. true. I think that's true. So what are we doing here, Tim? We've we teased yeah. this on group chat. Oh yeah. This is the birth of a lunch we had <laughs> probably two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. It's basically two worlds colliding. Yeah. I I would say we probably would disagree on almost everything in terms of uh politics. Life philosophy, <laughs> everything. <laughs> I think I think we're probably on very different ends of the spectrum for most everything. Okay, and yet I feel like I feel like I have the easiest time talking to you out of anyone on the podcast. Okay, I find it much easier to talk to you than to than to Pete. <laughs> <laughs> Even Pete, yeah. I thought you were going to refer to D and Drama. No, I mean D and Drama for sure. I mean that that's like I don't know if they <laughs> if they want to talk to me. <laughs> Everyone wants to talk to you, Tim. Yeah, well, don't they, sure change they will after this. Yeah, <laughs> now you're gonna be a star. Yeah, this is this is the beginning of my stardom. So we had a lunch for those who listen to group chat about two weeks ago, and we just come from two ends of the spectrum that are very different. My friend group and the people I've spent my entire life with are very different than the friend group that Tim has spent in his adulthood. Granted, you're young, so that could change over time. Maybe this podcast will make you change over time. Yeah. Maybe I, be seeking out different friends. I might have different friends by the end of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so we just wanted to kind of uh, riff and see where it goes. He, uh, yeah. Tim came up with an agenda, some questions he wants to ask. Yeah. And then we'll just go. No, because I, I, I don't want this to be as news focused or as like current events focused and sort of leave this a little more philosophical, a little bit, you know, less yeah, tangible. Agree. We and, do enough news on group chat yeah, and go yeah. to group chat for the news. And so I saw this as like a good opportunity to ask you some questions that are um, maybe a little bit, I don't know, just like, honestly, things that pique my curiosity about your life because sure. you lead a very different life from the one that I do. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, we, we we were sort of talking about politics on the at the end of group chat. I don't want this to be completely political, mm-hmm. but I want to ask. Like, I feel like um, the conservatives that I've known, and I'm not branding wow. you as a conservative, <laughs> you just right? Calling me a conservative, but you're you're definitely more conservative than me. So, you're for further, people who you're don't further, know us, you're further. Tim is the group chat socialist, and I'm the group chat capitalist. <laughs> I lean left on politics. I vote Democratic down the ballot. Um, so that's where I stand politically. And that's, it's also interesting that we both vote the same way for the most part and have such different views of the world. I mean, the, I will say, I don't think the parties we've had to choose from represent either side very well. Yeah. You know, like I, I think I would, I would hope that we would have voted the same way this past election, you know? Yeah. But, um, I, I know in the primaries, we would have voted very differently, yes. right? You were probably a Yang Yang guy. No, I voted Biden. 
Biden? Okay. Yeah. Because actually when California came up for primary, I was pretty convinced Biden was the only one that had a shot against Trump. And I think he had just won South Carolina. So all the momentum was swinging towards mm. Biden. Yeah. And I was like, I don't want, I want my vote to matter. Right. Because I think if you put some of these other candidates in, like a Warren or Sanders, like, unfortunately, I think they would have gotten smoked. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, I, I think that's like very level-headed and reasonable. I wanted like, to vote Mayor Pete. Oh, really? But I knew it was a wasted <laughs> vote. Why is, why is that? What drew you to Mayor Pete? I think he has the ability to speak very down the middle hmm. on some complex issues, despite yeah. being like one of the most prominent gay politi- pol- politician in, in the United States. Yeah, yeah. And I think he has a sense of uh, just reason. Like he chose to go on Fox News during the campaign and just get in the fire, get in the mud and intelligently kind of rebuke a lot of the things that uh, the right says. Yeah. And I and I think he's a very talented uh, politician. Do you feel like like the sort of more radical candidates you write off because you're you're like well they aren't going to get the popular vote or do you sort of cuz I've always been maybe this is just because I'm you know just graduating college and you know coming into the world and seeing the political landscape as fresh and new that I'm seeing a revolution happen and I'm seeing it grow by the day. Um, and you're someone who looks at trends. You're someone who's, who's able to predict things pretty well. Yeah. Um, do you, what, what do you make of like the political revolution? And like, when you look at more radical politicians like Bernie or AOC or. I think they resonate really well on social media, but I don't think they represent the electorate. Hmm. And I think, you know, it's, they're, they're really good sound bites but it's a really tough way to legislate. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's start with some of the questions you had for me. Okay. We set the tone. Yeah. This is the tone. Okay. (laughs) Uh, The first question I wanted to ask was uh, just sort of like, I wanted to to delve a little bit more into who we are and what our stances are, just because as we get into topics, I want to make sure that like people are understanding where we're coming from Mm -hmm. a little better. Financially, I would say there's a bit of a discrepancy between the two of us. <laughs> marginal, marginal. I picked for the, up the for, tab for the moment. Yeah. <laughs> for the moment, the you know. Even though you did offer to split, which I is did. very nice. I did. I will always offer to split. <laughs> Maybe I need to choose something more expensive and just kind of <laughs> <laughs> take me up on it. <laughs> Do a five hundred dollar meal. <laughs> split it with me. Yeah. Well, now I'm afraid. Um, so my question, my first question for you was, do you feel as though, um, everyone has an equal shot to make the amount of money that you've made in life? No, absolutely not. Okay. Uh, absolutely not. I think I'm the beneficiary of having parents that really drilled education as the most important thing. And they were able to be successful professionally that they didn't require us to go get jobs in the summer. So every summer in high school, I had to do summer school. I Mm. wasn't allowed to just go sit on the beach with friends. That wasn't even a, that's a non-starter is either go get an internship or go to summer school. If you don't do, you have, those are your only two choices. Okay. So it was this uh, complete concept of like, you're working, you're working, you're working. There's no summer break you know, winter break, you need to like study for your SATs or something. Right. Right. And so that enabled me to do well in school, to do well in my SATs, to get into college, get a scholarship at USC, which D did not. D was full price. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Broke the bank. Yeah. Well, I, I should, uh, I should, uh, you know, get some, get some uh, <laughs> rebate money I from that. Right. Should. I think you should. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. So, so it sounds like you you do firmly believe that like you've achieved this because you've put in the work and you've. I was sacrificed. given the tools from my parents that all this stuff really matters. Getting right. good grades matters. Testing well matters. Going to college and then you naturally gravitate towards more people that have the similar mindset. So then all my friends had the same view. We're going to study. We're going to get good grades. Like we had fun. Don't I'm not like. I mean, I had plenty of fun in college, but I actually would say it was really the last two years 
last year and a half of college, not the first two and a half years. I wasn't the guy on front row freshman, sophomore year. Right. I was just like, I did my thing. I went to the Lions Center, which is a recreational, played basketball, but I wasn't out partying. Right. And I was like, I need to make sure I get my grades. But do right. you have do you have any regrets about that? Like, no, do you not look at back all. on any of those experiences, like in high school or college, and say, man, I, I kind of wish I had taken more advantage of the fact that I didn't have responsibilities then that I have now. None. You know? None. Uh, so it enables you to live a much better life. You know, now I maybe at the time I probably had this FOMO for sure, but. When I reflect back, I'm 37. I reflect back, you know, 17, 18 years ago. I mean, here's a good example. So I went to USC and one of my close friends who went to UPenn, Wharton, super smart guy, like one of the smartest people I've ever come across. He helped me to score high on my SATs. He like taught me all the tricks and was like, this is what you need to do. This is how you like to get through the math portion. This is what you need to focus on verbal. Totally helped me. When he got to college, he's a year older than me. He's like, you need to go and invest in banking. I was like, hmm. okay, why? He goes, that's where the smartest people are. That's where you need to start your career. Interesting. And then he coached me on how to even get an investment banking job. And he taught me everything I need to regurgitate in the interview. It's a formula. It's not that hard. But if you actually just get presented the information, you can do it. And then I got my investment banking job, and then I was relieved. I was like, okay, now I can go have fun in college. Gotcha. Because I was just like, okay, gotcha. now I got this internship. I got my full-time offer. Senior, I don't need to worry about. Hmm. Okay. And then I, and you, if you counter to, I could, I remember I, in college, the people freshman, sophomore, year, junior, partying their balls off, their senior year was the most stressful time of their life. Because they did shitty in school and didn't have a job. Mm, yeah, yeah. And I was like, oh, I'm good. I've got this high-paying job right out of college. I don't give a shit. And then it comes to bite you in the ass because then you work in investment banking and you're working 100 hours a, a week. And then I have no Jeez. no life again. Yeah. And I see all these kids going to happy hours and stuff. And I had FOMO then. I was like, what am I doing? But you know, I still have no regrets on any of it. Yeah, wow. Here's the, dif the difference. Yeah. The uniqueness I had was that now in my mid twenties, my brother is best friends with the biggest uh, nightclub <laughs> folks in Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah. So I rolled right into this right, new life. Right. So there's the no regrets of right. like I got my fix in of like you know you've heard on the pod we go to every we went oh, to yeah. everything. Yeah. I mean, in our twenties, we were out five nights a week minimum. Yeah. So when you That's... when you reflect back on that, <laughs> yeah. What the fuck do I care about missing a frat party in my freshman year? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. I, I'm, I've sort of had the opposite experience being creatively driven where my work ethic has always come from within. So I feel like in high school, I was very driven outside of school. I organized multiple bands, wrote albums for them. By the time I got to college, I had released six or seven albums uh, that I had written and recorded and produced myself. And that was just because I couldn't stop myself from doing that. That's what I wanted to do with all of my time. And as I sat in a classroom, I just kept thinking, man, when can I leave here so that way I can get back to the thing I want to do? You know? Yeah. Whereas I feel like you've had this approach where you've realized that in, even in academics and in economics and things like that, there's a gamification that you can you can apply where you can figure out how to take the tests and you can figure out yes. how to get the grades. And uh, I I just never even had that desire because scoring well academically wasn't even on my radar. I I did well just because I had you know good parents and a, a good school system, good teachers. But I didn't. I didn't do well because I spent a ton of time studying or tried to figure out the system. You know? I think that's a good way to put it. The gamification, because when my friend who told me to go and invest in banking was like, "You need to have a minimum of a three point eight GPA in college." Because you don't get that coming from USC, because USC was considered not a good school back then. Uh, if you don't get minimum three point eight, you have no shot. So mm. he told me that pretty early on. Wow. 
And so I, I was just like, okay, I got to make sure I hit these marks, hit these marks. Yeah. And the gamification of it is when I would get a grade back on a paper or something, to me, that was the start of a negotiation. Huh. <laughs> with the professor. <laughs> I wasn't just taking, you know, a B. I was like, no. And I was wow. like, I got to make sure I get an A. Now I really see how you're related to D. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's probably the most mirthy thing I've ever heard in my life. So I was just like, you know, because <laughs> think about it in a semester. What's a semester? Four months, three months, three, four months. So you get your first paper back. You have another two and a half months to figure out right. how to get the A. Right, right. So then you go and you play the game, you talk to them, you butter them up and say, what do I need to improve? Next time, can I give you uh, my paper in advance and maybe you get some corrections and then they, you feed their ego. So you made the corrections that they told you to do. They're going to give you an A. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> I feel like if I, if I had known someone like you growing up, I would have had a very drastically different view of, <laughs> of <laughs> But school. I also think the gamification of getting an investment banking job interview. So yeah. I was given yeah, yeah. the information from my friend at Wharton, and then I relay that to like minimum 20 people at SC that all got banking jobs because it's formulaic. Right. Hey, these are the 10 questions they're going to ask. Even your strengths and weaknesses. What are your strengths and weaknesses? There's a right way and a wrong way to answer that. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, there's, an there's, a, there's a right way to do an interview. And yeah. I definitely didn't do that when I had the interview for this job, but I got it anyway. Yeah. No, so we used to do mock interviews in college with my friends. Yeah. Like I would interview them as if I was the person, because I'd already gone through it. So right, like my friends right. are a year younger and I'd be like, okay, this that, that answer is good. This answer isn't because this is how they're going to judge you. It is totally gamified. Yeah. Yeah. We had instead fake clients where the <laughs> professor would pretend to be a client and just give you a hard time and, you know, constantly make you feel like you weren't good at your job. So I, I assume that's similar. That's the art school version of that. Right. Because <laughs> you don't really, there's not as much in this industry of like interviews. It's a lot more of like, you just either know what you're doing or you don't and you make connections through that. Yeah. You know, as if, if you're good at what you do in art, I do feel like people catch on to it. But um, but don't you think it's the same in art? Meaning the artists that rise to the top also play the game. I think you there are the artists who have people behind them who can do that. Got there it. are people behind them who can gamify the system and know how to market them well. And those are the people who are at the top. Which is why, I mean, I've always thought the people who are, you know, the the top Grammy award-winning artists who top Billboard every year, those artists are not the most talented musicians in the world. Right. They're just the people who had the right opportunities and had the, had enough talent to survive those opportunities and, and to, to take full advantage. Yeah, so I also think, back to your kind of point, if you sat with me for two weeks... I can guarantee you, you could walk into Goldman Sachs and get a job. Really? Because I think they I make two it, weeks. <laughs> they make it seem hard. They make it seem hard to outsiders that this world is so hard to crack. It's right. not. And I talk about this on group chat all the time. They want to confuse you. They want to complicate things. These concepts are very simple and basic. They want to make it seem like they're the only ones allowed past the velvet rope. Hmm. Yeah. And yeah. they want to keep everyone out. And. It's just access to information. I mean, that makes sense. And that's sort of what you've talked about with like Robin Hood sort of breaking that and giving yeah. people the opportunity to invest in companies and it stops feeling like something you have absolutely no understanding of and it starts... Yeah, because when you go on Robin Hood, it makes sense. Right. Oh, I, I want to buy this stock. It's two clicks and I believe in the company. Right, you go right. on Schwab, you go on E-Trade, they make it seem like you're taking a calculus test. Right, right. And I guess of of I'm sort of curious or I'm always tempted to ask somebody who's successful what their philosophy is on that and if they feel like, oh yeah, I just got lucky. Or if they feel like I really did have the wits about me to get to where I am now, you know? So I think someone who claims that they just earned it completely is full of shit. Because so many things had to go right. Who are your parents right. that you were born to? Right. What city were you 
did you grow up in? Yeah. Who were the people you were around when you were 15, 16? Yeah. What college yeah. did you go to? So all of that leads to the point where now your your access to opportunities is drastically different than someone else's. Right. So I think that's such a flawed way of thinking because, I mean, then to even, like my friend group only exists because I went to SC and I was in this like group of friends that were super ambitious. And then we all met more ambitious people when we graduated and the network spread. And that that's not earned. Right, right. That's like, you know, I, I would say there's, you have to work hard and you have to know where you, you have to put your effort into the right place. So I wouldn't say I got, I'm getting lucky. Luck definitely helps, but I also put myself in a position to succeed rather than like, you know, not. <laughs> right, right, right. And I, I I really appreciate that perspective. And I feel like it's it's kind of refreshing compared to the perspectives I've heard from other successful people in the past. Um, and I think those are the people, the people who think that they are where they are because they 100% earned it. Those are the people who create those walls like you were talking about with, with you know, Goldman Sachs. And, yeah. you know, those are the people who uphold those because they realize that this whole thing's a facade. Somewhere deep down, they have to know 100% that this is know. a facade. It's, it's, I mean, I see it with uh, early uh, tech investors. Like, I mean, we talked about on the podcast. I was a senior investor in Coupon and it became a, a very important, like life-changing event for me. I don't go around saying I'm the best tech investor in the world. Go, I people should go Google the Uber seed investors, seed investors mm. in Uber. They think they are geniuses and they've made careers and made hundreds of millions of dollars post Uber because they were granted as this genius that saw Uber before everyone else. <laughs> and do you know how many times like Uber had to iterate and pivot? Like, no, do you know who the genius was? Travis Kalanick. He was the genius. Not you, the early investor that got lucky to put 30K into an early stage right, deal. Right, right. And people get confused very easily, especially on the investing side, that you know your small check turned into a, a large fortune and you get confused that you're a genius. Right. Because it happens in technology the most because if you think about the last 10 years, the amount of wealth that's been created in this one industry... Anyone who was investing in technology in the last decade made money. Sure, the magnitudes can be very different, but it you'd have to be like the most unlucky person in the world to invest in technology the last decade and not make a reasonable amount of money. I'm weirdly tempted to play devil's advocate. Okay. <laughs> and and wonder like uh you know, as someone who's who studied this for a long time, uh, like investing and, and the art of investing and that there definitely is a skill involved and it, there definitely is a lot of, I, I would have to believe that the people who invested in Uber early on believed in what they were investing in and maybe, you know, had ind indicators that showed them that they would, this would be a good investment, right? So I think in the early stage, because this is what I did, early stage investing, you made a broad thesis on technology that technology is going to be important over the next 10 years and you spread your bets. Hmm. Okay. So just like a little, but you did have to have the insight that technology was going to be important. That's how like crypto, mm -hmm. how many times crypto has been doubted in the last decade, but you also take your signals and cues from experts in the industry. And you're like, okay, if all these people are doing one thing, I should probably pay attention. That's how I got my conviction in crypto came so strong. Cause I saw like Mark and and Ben Horowitz, these like, I mean, these guys created the internet. They created Netscape. The internet browser was the internet. And then in right. 2012, they start talking about crypto. Like they're on they're on Charlie Rose, they're on CNBC, they're on TED Talks. When no one cared about crypto, where it was like if you went to a, a mainstream media and talked about crypto, they'd be like laugh you off off the screen. And they were their conviction was so high. They're like, this is the internet in the 90s. And I kept seeing that, and I was like, oh, okay. It's pattern recognition, investing yeah. pattern recognition. Yeah, yeah, which is a skill. It is that I think sure, but I don't want it. I, 
I don't know why I'm playing devil's yeah. advocate right now. <laughs> I really don't know why, but I just feel tempted to because, because I feel like I've been in these conversations before. Um, I've known people who are just really good investors and have found immense success um, who firmly believe that this is a skill they possess that makes them a god, you know, that makes them better than, that makes them part of the elite, you know, elite class of, of people. And I, I have a, such a hard time understanding that coming from someone who just, I just don't prioritize finance right. <laughs> at all. You know, like my, my brain works in such a different way that I, I have a hard time even beginning a, a debate with that, with that kind of person. Yeah, those people don't realize that they're just having access to conversations that other people aren't, mm -hmm. which is why group chat is so important to me because I try to share as much as I learn in my personal life about all these different business opportunities and share it with people. Because when we started Queensbridge Venture Partners in 2012, you know who our first meeting was with? Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> because of Nas. It had nothing to do with me or Anthony. It's because of Nas. Wow. So that was my entryway into that's, technology. That's a really interesting... <laughs> Nas is an interesting <laughs> connector there. <laughs> well, no, it wasn't my entry into technology. We'd been investing, I'd been investing since 2008. But like, that was when we sat there, they presented to us why the internet over the next 10 years is going to be the greatest investment for wealth creation period. And they had all these data points, smartphone users, the ability to scale via cloud is like significantly cheaper. This is why it's not the late 1990s right. when everything crashed because these businesses just make sense economically. So uh, if that is my entry point into like this new world, guess what? You're I have a leg up well. on people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. And I really respect your, your, um, you know, your, your, forthcoming about that and you, you know your, your acknowledgement of that because I think that alone that self-awareness is like something that is very admirable and a lot of people lack that to begin with so I, I respect that and um, it definitely makes more sense as to why I have an easier time talking to you than <laughs> <laughs> some other people I can think of who probably have a similar bank account <laughs> No, but I think if you if you get confused, you'll you'll become an egomaniac. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not confused how we got into the deals we got into. Right, right, right. I I'm very self aware that one of my best friends ended up becoming one of the best technology investors of the last ten years. <laughs> like that's pretty that's pretty fortunate. Yeah. Then uh, Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz let us in Coinbase. That's pretty fortunate. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about like your your philosophy of working to live versus living to work. Because I feel like that's another thing we talked about in our lunch together that we discovered we're on completely different ends of the spectrum in terms of where would you, where, where do you feel like you sit on that spectrum? In terms of working to live or living to work? Yeah. I think, it's, I'm, I feel like I'm pretty balanced. Like even in my 20s, outside of the, handful of years I did invest in banking, I had plenty of fun. You know, it, it, when I joined 5-4, we had to grind. And it was like a lot of tough times, not make, not knowing how to make payroll, you know, getting yelled at by our investors because we mismanaged something. But we turned off the switch at like 8 p.m. and went out and had fun. And then we go take our lashing in the morning. Right, right. So I feel like I've had a pretty good balance of that, that like, I'm not, I'm not some workaholic that sacrificed my entire twenties, 24 hours a day, you know, just grinding, grinding, grinding. I think I did both. Um, but I do think it also depends on what is important to you. I had this view in my twenties that I'm going to work. So in my twenties, I decided that every free cash that I had from savings would go into high risk investments. And I'll do that until I'm married with kids because I know I'll always be able to earn. Right. And I don't need these savings. Like I didn't want to go buy a condo. I was like, I'm going for home runs. And that's what I chose to do. But I mean, I still had fun. Yeah. Yeah. I, do, do you feel like 
you've really enjoyed the work that you've done though? Or do you, do you feel like when you look back on the amount of time you've spent, whether it was, you know, studying to eventually do the job that you're doing or doing internships that would eventually get you to, to what you're doing, do you look at those and say, well, that was, you know, I look back on that really fondly. Those are, you know, great life experiences that I, that I value. Or do you just kind of look at that as like, that was my head in the sand ostrich moment, you know? <laughs> I don't think I had a head in the sand ostrich moment. Investment banking is the funniest. I only did it for two years, but I remember it so vividly because mm-hmm. it was such a like impactful moment in my life. It changed my perspective on hard work uh, attention to detail, all these things that I didn't really know mattered because they don't teach you in college. Right. Because I gamified how I got A's. Right. But you can't gamify, you know, modeling out something on Excel because it's wrong, right. It's right or wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're yeah. going to get yelled at <laughs> you, or you're You got to put in the work. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Do you know what it also did? Is that in USC is not considered, you know, a, a premier school. It's considered a good school. But what it made me realize, I was now in an industry where 90% of the people were from premier schools. Right. Princeton, Yale, Harvard, Stanford, whatever. And I realized they're not that much smarter than any of us. And I was like, oh, this is all a bullshit. They got into these schools because they went to the ritzy private school. So for example, in my high school, a thousand kids in our senior class, one kid got into Stanford. One. No one got into Harvard. And He's one of my best friends, smart as hell. He deserved to get into everything. I had the scores. Had I gone to Harvard Westlake or something else, I would have gotten to all these schools. My scores matched. They just don't take kids from public schools like the way they do private schools. Right, right. And then they reinforce that uh, inferiority complex that I went to SC. And then I go and I, in this like intro to Citigroup in New York City, they fly us all out and it's everyone from all these Ivy League schools and you're so intimidated. Right. And then once you get to actually doing the work, you're like, oh, these kids aren't that fucking smart. <laughs> Fuck out <laughs> right, of here. Right. That intimidation <laughs> always comes from the top down yeah. because then you look at people who didn't, you know, who went to schools worse than USC. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's just this weird food chain that gets created. Um, I, I know I was trying to change the topic away from politics, but now I'm tempted to go back and okay. say... To what extent do you feel responsible to like, I guess we're getting into taxes, but like, okay. you know, what? to what extent do you feel responsible for, for sharing your, your success? I think taxes are obvious and I think that's the hot button. Right. But here's, here's the issue is that the, and I have no problem paying taxes. I have no problem with any of that, but when you know the stewards of capital, the people you pay your taxes to, aka the government, are completely mismanaging it, it's tough to get comfortable with paying more and more and more. Right. And I think that's the struggle from the smart people that I know that are rich, that are like, I have no problem paying taxes if we knew it was going to the benefit of society. But then you see articles come out that lifeguards in California make $400,000 a year because they just tack on overtime. Like, why is a lifeguard <laughs> making $400,000 a year? How many people are being saved <laughs> yeah. from drowning? I don't think that many. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, It's not this like critical like need in the state that all these people are drowning. If, if thousands of people were d- drowning in, in the Pacific Ocean, then yeah, <laughs> lifeguards should be paid $400,000 a year. Yeah. But yeah. they're not. No, no. But I think they should be paid, you know, I think that's that's overpaid for that position. But they there are so many positions that are equally valuable or more valuable. They get paid a lot less, you know. Sure. Um, and I think there's sort of a um, s- sort of a, a paradox being created where the people at the top are the ones who are capable of ending the corruption in politics because they're the ones who create the corruption in politics, mm-hmm. right? Um, and they say, well, we don't want to be taxed because politics are corrupt. You see, you see what I mean? Like, like it's, it's this weird cycle. It's a cycle. never-ending cycle. It's a never-ending cycle that could be fixed through a political revolution, but you know, Bernie talks about that being from the ground up. 
I, the, the further I research it, the more I realize it needs to be from the top down. It needs to be, it, big money is not going to get out of politics until big money realizes that having a system in place that would be able to properly function is better than a corrupt one. So yeah, in theory, you're right. Right, right. But here's the problem. Special okay. interests aren't going away. So, you know, even in this $1.9 trillion bill that Biden passed and Democrats passed, I'm in full support of it. But if we were to go back five years from now and see where the money got spent, we'll probably be like, we'll, we'll vomit. We're like, wait, the right. company got a $100 billion contract? Accenture got paid $100 million to do a COVID website for California. <laughs> A COVID oh website, God. you could have done it. Pete could have yeah. done it. Anyone could have done it. Yeah, yeah. So That's how do you how do you uh, re- like reconcile that? Well, because I I think that I think there needs to be a base uh, amount of taxes that need to be paid. The real issue is if the system's so broken because of how many special interests and unions and lobbyists both are problems, right? And I, I just don't know how to fix it. But I do believe that everyone should have access to healthcare. I do believe everyone should have access to a living wage. I believe in all these things. Right, right. How the government provides that is where like the real problem is. Right. Do you think there is a utopia in which it is possible for the government to provide those well? Or do you feel With like the it's right always... politicians, yes. Right. But you need to like get rid of all these guys. Right. Like I mean right. if, I mean if you which, think about which would be which would be really easy. If they stopped getting, you know, if they if it was no longer possible for them to accept these fat checks, yeah, right, and that's something that can be done at the top. That's something that but can be done. People are benefiting from that at the top that they have no incentive to, right? Well, the, yeah, that that's what makes me think, like, why, you know, why Don't then you do think Bernie's t- argument gets completely off the tracks when he says Jeff Bezos shouldn't be worth one hundred fifty billion? Well, this is this is my point. Is like, why then do people at the top decide? Oh, you know, I'm I'm in a position where I get to decide whether the government is, you know, capable of of distributing my, you know, my taxes fairly. Whether it's going to to no, but Bernie Sanders' point is Jeff Bezos shouldn't be worth 150 billion. Amazon has changed the lives of Americans. Every right. American, I think, what's the percentage? But what is of what is what Don't just you, if, that is that is an amount of money that I cu- I couldn't even begin to think of how I would spend it in a lifetime so all, or a hundred lifetimes. He's already pledged the the half. He's going to give away whatever wealth. Right, hundred fifty billions because the stock ran up. So why is it his fault that he's created so much value for consumers? Because it's a feedback loop. If consumers didn't like Amazon, Amazon wouldn't be worth as much. I think so consumers, why, why, consumers why should, aren't, shouldn't be faulted for liking Amazon. So I think what, the system it, should be faulted for allowing somebody to become so wealthy that they've become more powerful than any system that we've put in place. So what does that mean? It means that, it, it means that everything's, you know, it's broken. We, we need a political no, but why, revolution. No, so but why, that's where I think Bernie's coming from. Is like, yeah, but, what, that's, but you're also not going to get innovation. I think you'll get innovation. I think I think if if somebody is is able to still amass, you know, incredible wealth, but just not the amount that is so absurd that it can solve all of the world's problems. You can't. 150 million can't. We just passed 1.9 trillion and it's gonna do pretty much damn near nothing. Why why do you say it's gonna do nothing? (laughs) Because it's gonna be it's gonna go to these like terrible contracted jobs. We'll get some roads, we'll get some stuff. The amount of pork barrel legislation that's probably in the one point nine trillion, we're gonna pass another three trillion for infrastructure, another STEMI, hundred and fifty billion is nothing. Right. But it it is just a feedback loop, right? Because then it's it's like So in a perfect world, what do you want Jeff Bezos to do? How should in a perfect world I want a government that 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 is you know functioning in a democratic way. <laughs> I want a government that is functioning to serve so the people. So are you angry that Jeff Bezos serving... is worth $150 billion? 
I'm angry that there's a system that has allowed him to become more more powerful than the government because how is he more powerful than the government? Because corporations that are able to elect politicians that work towards their yeah, but there's so many multi trillion dollar companies now and north of five hundred billion that have the same impact on politicians. I mean, Jeff Bezos has. Public enemy number one the last four years was Donald Trump, and he still amassed the wealth. Despite Donald Trump being, he hated his guts. Right, because I, I, don't, I don't think it's a party issue. I don't think this is a Republican issue, right? So you don't think a, 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 an entrepreneur who effectively changed consumership in the United States of America should be able to amass wealth? I think they should be able to amass wealth. But you think I just there should don't be a ceiling? Jeff Bezos didn't just like claw tooth and nail through, you know, did. out of a hole in order to like create this. He kind of did. He, th- I mean, he was doubted was... by the public markets from the moment they went public. Everyone thought like, what is going on? This guy has no idea what he's doing. And he figured it all out. He was, he was doubted as much as any tech entrepreneur of the successful ones, more than Facebook, more than Microsoft, more than uh, Google. No one doubted those three companies. Everyone doubted Amazon in the early 2000s. And he figured it out. He earned, he definitely should be wealthy. I think there's no question about that. The question is just whether the system, the governmental system in place should be able to govern him or not. Because I feel like at a certain point, Amazon can pass that and say, well, you know, we could do whatever we want. No, I think that's third world politics. And I think it's, I think that's what we're that's that's what we're transitioning into as we allow every every um, civilization in history that is that is collapsed. One of the major factors has been the gap between the wealthy and the poor. That's, yeah, that is a trend throughout history among I, every that's civilization. That's a whole different conversation because I don't think so. I believe in two things. I believe okay. entrepreneurs who build services that the consumers are saying are valuable and they amass a great deal of wealth perfectly fine by me. Do I think we need to pick up the poor? Yes. But I don't think we need to stop the innovation. Because if you stop the innovation, this is going to be a less interesting society. I'll tell you firsthand, like, I think China's leaps and bounds ahead of us in technology the last five years. And the U.S. is going to suffer because of it. TikTok came in and kicked everyone's ass. It's a Chinese company. Yeah. And every American kid is on TikTok. Yeah, even me now. Yeah. Follow me on TikTok. There you go. <laughs> so my point is you're gonna you're gonna if you keep if you regulate tech the way a lot of politicians want to, you're gonna stop innovation and China's gonna come kick our ass. So you have well, it's to balance interesting it. that China is able to kick our ass, a system that I would say is a lot do you feel like like China authori- is more capitalist than us? No, they're authoritarian capitalism. Okay. So what 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 is the system in place in China that allowed them to do that? What they've done is they've been able to create enough jobs and wealth to create the ma- keep the masses happy. Mm-hmm. But with the way they operate, you're sacrificing your human rights. Yeah, yeah. No, I and I definitely <laughs> don't think that we should live in China. That's not the yeah. point I'm making. I'm just trying to. I'm just trying to find where the line is between allowing a company to become so powerful or even an individual to become so powerful that they're untouchable. You know, it, I think but it's I hard think to see that as a... that's on the burden of the politicians because we've seen the hearings. These senators are out to lunch. Yeah. They have oh, yeah. no idea what questions to ask. They didn't do the homework. Yeah. They didn't do anything. Right. So why is it the, I mean, it's the politician's fault that they're not asking the right questions for the American public to hear. The average voter should not be an expert on Facebook and Microsoft and Google. And if you want to regulate them, become an expert and tell the American people why they need to be regulated or what aspects need to be regulated. So that's that burden, in my opinion, is on the politicians for asking dumbass questions in those congressional hearings. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I again, like I think that those politicians are softballing because they're in the position that they're in because they're part of this corrupt system, right? I mean, I feel like in those press conferences, the people who ask the right questions are typically Bernie, <laughs> AOC. It's like the very few people who seem to to not live in the pockets of corporations. They're the ones who ask the right questions. Um, I, 
I don't know that that's just sort of where where I'm at in terms of thinking of of the distribution of wealth where I don't think anyone needs the amount of money that Jeff Bezos has. And I don't think that if you the, cut that in half, you would, the, you would stifle uh, but most in, innovation. most of those guys are giving away all their money anyways. Right. And I don't I mean, think... Bill it, Gates is worth over $100 billion. He said he's giving away all of it. So so we're just going to hope that whoever gets to the top has a good heart, has a big enough heart that they want to help Zuck people. Zuck has already... Because d- what happens if, if someone like Trump, who is definitely not at that level of wealth, no. finds his way up there? Because I think it, you know, we've we've seen now that like... That's what ha- that's can easily happen. I mean, but, look at they, Elon, someone so, who can someone who can inflate his stock and increase his his net worth whenever. So I don't think you need to worry about that in the U.S. because the economy is too big. You're never mm-hmm. going to have a guy worth, you know, twenty five percent of U.S. GDP. It's just not going to happen. I have, have a hard time believing that based on the rate, the accelerating rate at which these companies are growing, the accelerating rate at which. You know, Jeff Bezos' wealth is growing, with the exception of his divorces and <laughs> whatever yes. else costs him money. See, we have natural mechanisms here. <laughs> <laughs> no. We just be wealth. No, I think I think you let I don't, you let a system like this play out, I think and you're, you need and to you're be scared, setting yourself up for disaster. What you need to be more scared about is a smarter, more savvy Trump. Yeah, Not, and I am. It has nothing to do with wealth. I That's think it point. does. I think no, I think a more savvy mongering. Trump figures out how to instead of just, you know, becoming the top, you know, Twitter handle, figures out how to become Jeff Bezos or bigger than Jeff Bezos and gets to the top and says, I don't want to, I don't want to give half of my wealth to to NGOs. I don't want to do that, you know? That there's nothing stopping him from doing that, right? Which is why governmental systems were created in the first place. Yeah. Right? I mean, this this is what happens is people can people can gamify if the there system. If there was a nefarious the actor, they would get antitrust, they'd be tied up in regulation politics. The difference with what's going on with all these tech politicians or tech executives is there in my opinion, Zuck has done a lot of bad stuff and probably needs to like get regulated a little more. But, I mean, I don't think Bezos is, what has Bezos done that's bad? We're lucky. We're lucky. Like, well, honestly, we're lucky. that's bad? I think Facebook well, Somebody being, being at that really- level of wealth and not slipping into some kind of, you know, God complex and creating wreaking havoc upon the country. I, I think that is, I think we're fortunate. To be we're, honest, we're, it's, it's social media that's wreaked havoc on the country. Because so. just with fake news, oh, the yeah. way yeah. audiences are, you're in an echo chamber, they can feed you whatever uh, thought bubble you want to hear. Yeah, yeah. And then you radicalize people. Yeah. You go down one rabbit hole. I think YouTube's probably the most dangerous. It is dangerous. But it's also, it also sort of creates the Robin Hood effect of being able to make Actually, sure that voices aren't being stifled, making sure that people, you know, have access to. But here's what the politicians don't understand. Google bought a company called DeepMind. DeepMind is basically figuring out what you, Tim, mm-hmm. you watch three videos in a row. Right. They're going to get you down this chamber. Boom, 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 to everything that they, they, they know better than you. Right. And do you think a politician understands that? That actually TikTok and YouTube are actually incepting the minds of Americans and feeding them the content before they even know that they they that's what's gonna get their endorphins. I think I think thanks to, you know, a lot of like the social dilemma and a lot of like works that have been published about this, I'd like to believe that politicians do know this. And the question you, is the question is whether they voice those things or Because act here's a on basic them. if you want basic regulation, don't let DeepMind's algorithm dictate YouTube because if you can't predict what you're going to like and feed you down this rabbit hole, you'll be more open to other opinions. Right. Right. And have a more worldly view about something. Yeah. But who's smart enough to figure that out? Not I, <laughs> <laughs> not I, I don't claim to have all the answers. I do claim to, to, to be able to, uh, See a broken system when when it's. I think the system's me. broken. I'm not yeah. debating that. Right, right. I just I think I think the the part that is broken is the fact that we're allowing people to amass such exuberant wealth. I don't think that's know? the issue. 
I just that's where we disagree. Yeah, that that's where we disagree. But I think time will tell. You know, I think I think give it give it a hundred years, and if we allow this to continue, somebody who's who's not as you know uh, level headed or kind hearted as Bezos or Bill Gates will reach a very dangerous and powerful. So status. Despite me thinking the system's broken, I do think there's enough checks and regulations that that won't happen. There won't be this business guy. Like Bloomberg was worth, <laughs> how much was he worth? I think, was it a hundred billion, 50 billion? Africa, it's something. Abs- he couldn't even get out of the primaries. Well, I mean, that's... and he had more money than every politician combined. Yeah. But he could not get out of the damn primaries. I think there were far more powerful corporations working against him who didn't want him. <laughs> oh, so you're playing the counter. But uh, I think we have enough checks and regulations. I'm not afraid of a nefarious business titan that takes over the U.S. economy and affects us negatively. I think we have I think they don't even need to work through politics. I think somebody can amass wealth independently, reach a level where they, you know, they, they evade any kind of taxation. They don't pay anything to, uh, you know, NGOs, and they just decide, I'm going to create my own my own empire. Yeah, I think that's not that far off from from reality. You know, I think we're 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 decades away from seeing somebody do that, and it's terrifying. And I I think that's just one of many factors at play that that makes me agree with Bernie and say, we do need a political revolution. We need a system that governs people and a system that works for people. Because without those two things, I agree you're with right. both of those you things. shouldn't be taxed if your taxes are going completely to the military. Yes. It's, un, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. The you know, I, US like I think, military budget annually is bigger than the next nine countries combined. Yeah. But I, th- I think it's possible for people at the top to create that change, you know? And I think that's one of the reasons Bernie goes after those people is to make, you know. You just think he's trying to keep them honest. Yeah. I think there's there's a... So you're saying going so extreme gets them in their conscience about how they act. Which if that's yeah. his goal, that's fine. Or just, or just inspires people to say, oh, we do need to hold those people accountable, you know? Yeah. Because I think otherwise what... What's going to do it? You know, hopefully this has prepared me for uh, the Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he's listening. <laughs> this is it. Coming for you, Jordan. <laughs> Pan capitalist. Pan capitalist. Got through our first episode. Yeah. It was fun. Uh, it was fun. I really appreciate, I respect your beliefs and I respect your ability to, um, your, your poise and your ability to, to reason with me. You know, despite having very different backgrounds, and I appreciate that you took the time to. It was a lot of fun. This podcast. We're gonna yeah. figure out how we're gonna do this, but we're gonna figure some sort of game plan. Whether it's a seasons and we do a handful of deep dives, mm-hmm. or and what, if people but- want it to be every day, <laughs> so be it. <laughs> so it wants me in here every day. Yep. If if this gets bigger than group chat, I mean, so be it. So be it. If if that's if that's the as way long as you're the crumbles. number one and number two podcast in the world, exactly. that's all that matters. Exactly. <laughs>